Please be seated. The children may come forward for a word with Edith. Well, good morning, my friends. It's nice to see you. I know Henry was here last week. So how about Blake? Would you like to do the honors today? And we're going to find out what our word of the week is. Kind of looks like a medium word. Let's see. Let's see if JP can help me hold it here. So it's proverb. Have you ever heard this word before? Yeah. You have? So what do you think it means? What's a proverb? Can you tell me? I don't know. I'm the leader. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I think a proverb is, okay? A proverb is a simple, short sentence that's filled with wisdom and it teaches us about life and helps make us think and make good choices. And there's a book in our Older Testament in our Bible called Proverbs, more, which means more than one, and people believe that it was written by King Solomon. You may not know this, but King Solomon could ask God for anything that King Solomon wanted. And what do you think King Solomon asked for? What would you ask God for if God could say you could have anything? What would you want? What do you think you'd ask God for? Candy? Okay, that's a good one, right? Anybody else? Candy? We might ask that our neighbors have food to eat so that everybody has enough food to eat and they have a roof over their heads. Okay. Okay. So if you could ask God for anything, what would you ask God for? I would ask him for ice cream. Ice cream, okay. And I want my brother ask for ice cream too. Ice cream too, okay. And a and a beautiful picture for my mom. And a beautiful picture for your mom. That's nice. So we are going to learn a little bit more about Proverbs back in the narthex during summer grace place. So we're going to end with a prayer, and then we're going to go head out, okay? Yay! So are we ready? So excited! I'm so excited! Okay. Let's go! Okay. Okay. okay, we got to get ready to pray first, okay? Dear God, thank you for giving Solomon wisdom that he shared with others. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, the Lord, the Savior, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who is wisdom. Amen. The next four weeks, including today, so the, the, today and then the next three weeks, <clears throat> we're, we're going to be exploring three books of the Bible, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, all of which are asking and answering a question of how to live the good life. I mean, what does it mean, right? What does it mean to live the good life? Now, it's true. <laughs> the book of Proverbs is not exactly the cliffhanger novel that one, many of us would like prefer to read. Ecclesiastes, well, it might, have, might as well have been written by Eeyore. <laughs> oh, bother. There's nothing new under the sun. Oh, bother. Vanity of vanities. Everything is vanities. And the Song of Solomon might be more suited to be read quietly at home behind closed doors to your beloved. Nevertheless, these three books are still a part of our holy scriptures. The Reverend Dr. Catherine Schifferdecker, isn't that a great name? I just love that name, Reverend Dr. Catherine Schifferdecker. She writes in her introduction, introduction to this four-week series, she writes... All three books are traditionally ascribed to King Solomon. In a perceptive, if a historical interpretation, the rabbis said that Solomon wrote Song of Solomon in his amorous youth, Proverbs in a seasoned middle age, and Ecclesiastes in disillusioned old age. And you'll understand why that is when we get there. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are from the part of the Bible referred to as the wisdom literature. And as such, their purpose is, as Dr. Schifferdecker writes, 
to teach its readers and hearers wisdom. That is, the attitude and means by which to live well. This kind of common sense wisdom, she continues, is based not on revelation, and there's no burning bushes here, but on experience and observation. Or said another way, wisdom literature is how, we might say, to respond to the gospel that we've received. Is that living the good life? This book contains poetry and sayings to help us live our lives in such a way to make the world a more trustworthy place. Do you suppose that's what it might mean to live the good life? In the first part of today's reading from Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Or said in a different place in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what almost always happens, in fact it happened on Thursday during my Holy Conversations class, Someone will ask about fearing the Lord, or they will offer that they really struggle with the idea of fearing God as a necessary thing for wisdom. That's a good question. And it's important right then and there, right in this moment, to think, I think, that, um, to, to think on this a little bit differently and to remember that the fear of the Lord means actually to be struck with reverent awe. Like, have you ever met somebody that you really, really looked up to, but maybe it was somebody on television that you've never met, and you weren't even necessarily around them often, but there they come around the corner, and whew, I once ran into Jimmy Carter, literally ran into Jimmy Carter. I was in a dead sprint, came around the corner, I was trying to buy my girlfriend flowers on Friday at St. Olaf College. We knew that President Carter was, in fact, on campus for Habitat of Humanity speech, and I came running around the corner, and I missed him by an eyelash. And he goes, whoa, young man, you're in a hurry. And I said, I, I, I've got, you kissed my sister. He looked at me befuddled. 1976, I said. We are in Philadelphia. You came by with President Ford, uh, yeah, in a motorcade right behind President Ford. You saw my brother, my sister, me, and my mom standing on the corner. You got out, walked across for a photo op, shook my, hand, shook my brother's hand, patted me on the head, and kissed my sister. And he goes, the context matters. <laughs> and it does. Fear of the Lord is, you know, when you're struck like that, you don't really know what to say. What do you say when you meet a president? Hello. Sometimes it comes out, you kissed my sister. It's like that. Or the feeling that you had when you met that super famous, influential, powerful person. Or the fear of the Lord might be like this. When you stand at the very edge of an enormous cliff at sunset, 1,000 feet above the craggy canyon floor, mouth agape, staring at the absolute grandeur of the sight before you, marveling at the miraculous magnificence that it is our God who created this vista, and yet simultaneously being gobsmacked at the truth that the one who created this view also loves and adores little old me. The fear of the Lord is not at all the same thing as being afraid or scared of God. It is to be in awe. Dr. Schifferdecker teaches us, it's the fear of the Lord that Mr. and Mrs. Beaver described to the children in this scene from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Mr. Beaver says to the children, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Dr. Schifferdecker continues, the fear of the Lord the fear of the God who created the universe. 
but who deigns to be in relationship with us is the prerequisite for wisdom. Such proper fear teaches us our place in the world and how to live well in it. Over the past several decades, Christianity, I think, has done a good job preaching a Jesus who is our brother and friend. I do wonder, however, whether we might have gone a little too far since we now have some praise songs which sound a lot like Jesus is my boyfriend or the hippie surfer dude. We would do well to remember that the one, on the one hand, God is the almighty creator of the universe who alone holds the power to defy a black hole's gravitational pull, while on the other hand, God is also gentle enough to cradle your baby. Intentionally maintaining reverence and awe of God is the beginning of wisdom because when we do this, we hold in the fore of our mind this beautiful truth that God is God and we are not. And yet, we are also not nothings to this almighty creator. We are in fact the creatures of the creator and as such, our creator has some things to teach us. Within Proverbs are some of these teachings, and it proclaims that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But we do not need to be afraid of God. Instead, God would have us live our lives in the knowledge that we are loved and that we are God's beloved people who in this book of the Bible, as Dr. Schifferdecker writes, are being instructed not so much with issues of salvation, but with issues of how to live everyday life in this world of God's good creation. God's wisdom blesses our soul, but also the body. God's wisdom heals the spirit and our flesh. Here's how hymn writer Susan Paolo Cherwin says it in our next hymn. Beloved, God's chosen, call forth wisdom to dwell in you richly. Let peace rule your hearts, and that peace be of Christ. And from the heart's chamber, beloved and holy, let singing thanksgiving to God ever rise. And above all, before all, let love be your raiment that binds every one. It binds into one every dissonant part. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom starts, and I think this is what it means to live the good life. Amen.
Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. O oh God, you call your church to proclaim the gospel of reconciliation and truth, both near and far. Guide your church as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting your spirit bearing witness among us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You brought forth all creation and called it good. Direct policymakers to protect lands and seas. Bring rain to sun-parched fields and protect areas impacted by natural disasters. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You desire peace among nations and peoples. Guard our neighborhoods from hatred. Watch over police officers and firefighters and teach us how to advocate for those who live in fear. Hear us, O oh God. You are gracious and merciful, comforting those who suffer any affliction. Today we lift to you Kathy Cashin, Brian Conrad, Bruce Walker, Jane Samuelson, Pastor Carl Jacobson, Jane McNaughton, Lana Titi, Mary Vollmer, Debbie Tuvey, George Tuvey, Nels Tuvey, Deborah Jacobs, Michael Coode, Donna Collins, Colleen Petenpaul, Sandy Rader, David Rhinus, and others we name in our hearts. Sustain your people living with HIV and AIDS. Provide shelter for all those who are unhoused and release any who are unjustly imprisoned. Hear us, O oh God. You name all the baptizers your children. Guide our hospitality ministry to welcome all, our education ministry to equip us for faithful living, and our social ministry to enact the gospel in our community. Hear us, O oh God. You send faithful people to proclaim freedom from bondage and to renew your church. Encourage us by the witness of the faithful departed so that we may live into that same hope. Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen.